Well, good morning. If we could turn, please, once again in the book of Ezekiel, and this time we're going to be reading chapter 17. We'll read the first 10 verses, and we're going to be thinking this morning about two eagles and three shoots. Two eagles and three shoots, as in uh, shoots coming out of the ground. So verse 17, uh, ch verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him, and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. There was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him and shot forth her branches toward him that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. It was planted in a good soil by great waters that it might bring forth branches and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. Say thou, thus saith the Lord God, shall it prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof that it wither? It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring even without great power are many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither? When the east wind toucheth it, it shall wither in the furrows whereof it grew. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. Now, before we dive into chapter 17, we just have a little bit of um, unfinished business in chapter 16. I think we had uh, got last time up to verse 61. And uh, of course, it's about the new covenant. And I just wanted to finish off uh, this uh, chapter. And it really is interesting that this chapter, which is probably one of the most bleakest chapters in the sense that God had accused uh, Judah, as we remember last time, of being worse than Sodom and uh, also uh, worse than Samaria and accusing uh, this nation of her multiple whoredoms and harlotries. And it was a, a hard chapter to look at uh, because it was it was really uh, very bleak in its condemnation of Judah. But even at the end of that chapter, there's a uh, there's a, a glimmer of hope. And God is saying that even though they were covenant breakers, uh, they had broken the covenant, uh, the, the marriage covenant that they had entered into with Jehovah, that he, being as faithful as he was, was not going to break his part of the deal. In fact, he was going to make a new covenant with them. And so we'll just read verse 60. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. So God is saying to them, uh, I'm not going to forget. Even though you forgot your covenant, you uh, didn't keep your side of the bargain, uh, I'm going to remember my covenant with you when I when I rescued you in the beginning. I'm going to remember that, but I'm also going to enter into a new covenant, and this one is going to be an everlasting covenant. And so he says, verse 61, Then shalt thou remember thy ways and be ashamed uh, when thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder, and thy younger, and I will give them unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant. I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So God is going to enter into this new covenant with the nation of Israel. And it's, it's a tremendous thing that you know, God is going to do with them. He's not only going to make good on the past covenants that he made, 
but he's also going to make this new covenant with them. And unfortunately, uh, many in, in Christendom uh, do not pay attention to the covenants of Scripture. And uh, they that's why they have Israel is completely finished, because they're not paying attention to the covenants of Scripture. And God is going to fulfill his covenants that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's going to do it through this new covenant that he's going to enter into and make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And so he's going to do this. And um, uh, uh, when he does that, they will know that he is the Lord. And so verse 63, uh, it tells us this, that thou mayest remember and be confounded and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. Now, this is a very important verse, verse 63, that we want to pay attention to. First of all, notice that he's going to say to them that uh, in that day, uh, that their, their mouth's going to be stopped. It says, that thou mayest remember and be confounded and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame. And so it reminds us of Romans 3.19, doesn't it, where God says that every mouth will be stopped, all the world will be made guilty before God. And they're going to come to this place where they're filled with shame and how they have treated their husband, and they will, uh, again, the, 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 their mouth is going to be stopped. They're not going to be criticizing anymore. They're not going to be saying anything negative or trying to justify themselves. They're going to acknowledge their guilt before God uh, for the way they treated their husband. And then uh, another word here that's very significant in verse 63, it says, when I am pacified toward thee, for all that thou hast done. Now, what's interesting is that this word pacified is the word that normally is translated atonement. And so God is saying, when I am pacified towards you, or more literally, when I atone for you. And so God's grace is going to accomplish the work for them so that they might be restored to him, but that work is going to be an atoning work that's going to make it possible for him to take up his dealings with this nation and bless them again. And of course, we know who it was that accomplished that work. It's the Lord Jesus. He is the mediator of the new covenant by his blood. Uh, he's going to make it possible for them to come into this relationship with him uh, in this new covenant. It's going to be the atoning work that's going to deal with all of their past sins and uh, uh, put them all away. And so uh, he's giving this idea of a God-provided atonement, uh, an important aspect of the new covenant. Now, we said already in chapter 11, he's hinted at this new covenant relationship in chapter 11, verse 17 through 21. And I'll just take a minute to read it. It says, therefore, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people, assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. I'll give you the land of Israel and they shall come thither. They shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll take the stony heart of out of their flesh will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes, keep mine ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I'll be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I'll recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. So kind of a mixed response. Those that those that do respond to God, uh, they're gonna, he's going to make this new covenant with him and then there's going to be others that are going to face judgment. And so we know when we look in the last days, that the nation of Israel, uh, the Lord is going to return to deliver them. And we know from Zechariah, they're going to look on him whom they've pierced and they're going to mourn for him. And then it tells us that there's going to be a fountain opened uh, for sin and for uncleanness. Of course, that's that fountain we often sing of, a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stains. And so those Jews that look on him and uh, that was pierced and believe on him and repent because of it, that new covenant will become good for them. They'll enter into it. They'll have a new heart, a new spirit that he'll put within them. And it'll be a regenerated Israel 
that go into this time of incredible prosperity under the new covenant. And so that's the, the future prospect. And again, back in verse 63, he says, when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done. The only thing that could pacify the heart of God against man's sin and rebellion is the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his work on Calvary's cross. And so <clears throat> as we, uh, of course, have considered the sad history of Israel in this chapter, it was brought out last time in the conversation afterwards, that it does remind us a little bit of the church of the Lord Jesus, and especially uh, how the church lost its first love, and then the Laodicean church, uh, when it had become rich and increased with goods and need of nothing. And of course, this is what happened with Israel. When they were taken, they had nothing, and then they reached their elevated state under Solomon. They were rich, increased with goods, need of nothing, and then they began their harlotry. And so there's definite parallels uh, to uh, the church in Laodicea, that is rich and increased with goods, has need of nothing, but basically has turned away from the Lord, so much so that he's outside of the house, uh, knocking on the door, wanting to come in. And so there's, there's certain parallels in chapter 16 that we want to draw and, and affirm. But now we want to move on to chapter 17. And this is uh, what we said about two eagles and three shoots. Now, this uh, chapter... Uh, it's there's, there's necessary background to it in other places. So I, I'm going to give you um, some scripture references. Now, we're not going to look at all of them, although we will probably turn to all of them during the course of the study, but not right now. But I'm going to just give you them to begin with. So if you really want to understand Ezekiel 17, you also need to read the following chapters. Now, we're going to read from one of them, but I'm going to list them all. Uh, and and so it's kind of interesting how, you know, one of the things we do in Bible study method is we compare scripture with scripture. And often other scriptures throw light on the passage we're looking at. Well, this is a, a case in point. And so the first reference I'm going to give you, and again, we probably will turn to some of it during the course of our study, is in Second Kings chapter 24 and verses 8 through 20. So if you're a note taker, you can write that down. Uh, Second Chronicles 36, which again, Kings and Chronicles, a lot of parallelism, and verses 9 through 13. Now, what I will do is I'm going to read from this one. And so you get an idea what all these passages are about, and it will throw tremendous uh, shafts of light on, onto the passage we're looking at in uh, Ezekiel 17. So let me just read from Second Chronicles 36. And we get an idea a little bit about the eagles and the shoots uh, from this. So verse 9 of Second Chronicles 36, it says, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Isn't that incredible? At, at eight years of age three months reign, and he does evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was one and 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel." And so uh, just keep that, that thought in mind. So when we talk about two eagles and three shoots, two of the shoots are, are going to be Zedekiah and Jehoiakim, uh, the two kings. Jehoiakim, verse 9, Zedekiah is the second one. And we'll, we'll see. It'll, it'll explain itself as we go. But I just want you to know uh, these are key uh, passages to consider. Jeremiah 37 is another parallel passage and then Jeremiah 52 and verses 1 through 7. So those are the four passages that give necessary background when 
we look at this chapter. And of course, just to say this, that we're very thankful, I think, to the Lord, I hope we are, that scripture is often self-interpreting. That is, one passage throws light upon another passage. And by the way, just as an aside, that's why you need to be reading consecutively through the whole Bible. Because if you really want to understand the scriptures, one passage throws light on another passage. And so it's amazing. I do my readings. I've got four different places I read from. And it's amazing how many times when I'm reading through that one place I'm reading, another place throws light on what I'm reading in the other place. And that really is important to, to really compare Scripture with Scripture and allow Scripture to throw light on, on the Word of God. And so after um, listening to the previous messages, some of the uh, those in Jerusalem and those in captivity might be tempted to say, why should we be punished for the past sins of the nation? Remember, he'd just gone through all the idolatries, all the whoredoms of the nation in its past history in chapter 16. So there are some that would be listening to that and say, well, it's okay, but like, what about us? You see, we we didn't do all that. We're just, you know, we're being judged because of the past sin. So Ezekiel now addresses the current sin of the nation, and in particular, its leader Zedekiah, that being the sin of treachery and breaking an oath sworn in the name of the Lord. And again, I just want to go back to that passage that I just read from in 2 Chronicles 36. And we see here that he had sworn in the name of the Lord to Nebuchadnezzar that he wouldn't rebel. Uh, it was a kind of a vassal state. And so, it, again, we just want to take a minute to read uh, verse 12. He did, it says 2 Chronicles 36, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, his God humbled himself not before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. So he had made him king, had Nebuchadnezzar, uh, a kind of a vassal state, allowed them to stay in the land, and they could have stayed in the land continually had they kept their side of the bargain not to rebel. But what, what he did was, after a while, he turned from Nebuchadnezzar and looked to Egypt to help him so that he would no longer uh, have to be under Nebuchadnezzar's rule. And so he basically uh, broke the vow that he had made, and he had made it in the name of the Lord. So this is really kind of the background. It's about about failing to keep vows. Zedekiah was not a man of his word. And again, it's important for us that we be people of our word. If we make a vow, we ought to keep it. And I want to just go to a, another little portion in the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's just interesting where it talks about the importance of of keeping vows and not making vows and breaking them. And he says in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 through 6, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel, that is, that, that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? So again, very solemn responsibility that if you, you know, take a vow, swear in the name of the Lord, that you keep that vow. And so that's really the background to this chapter. So again, let's just kind of work our way through it and we'll see how it all ties together. But in verse one, he says, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, and again, just, just we said this kind of refrain runs through the book, that, that this is God's message through his messenger. Now, again, for us, um, we don't get direct revelation from God, but we have a revelation from God. It's the scriptures. And, and so uh, we, we, we need to make sure that when we're speaking, we convey that this is a message from God. Uh, it's the scriptures 
but it is God's message. And so there's that authority connected with it. And so as we preach, we, we should preach with that sense that we're, we're giving an authoritative message from God because we're speaking out of the scriptures. And by the way, we have no other authority. Our opinions are worthless. It's what does the word of God say? And when we're preaching, we can say, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says on this topic. And so we do need that kind of authoritative uh, teaching of the word of God and say, this is the word of the Lord. And of course, uh, I think it's good. Uh, I remember uh, when, uh, as a child, going to the, the Catholic Church, and when they would read from the scriptures, at the end of it, they would say, this is the word of the Lord. <laughs> and I like that. It's a good, It was good to be reminded, this is the word of the Lord. This is not some person's opinion. Pity they didn't take it seriously and obey it. But anyway, they did, at least they said, it is the word of the Lord. And so certainly... We, we want to recognize God speaking. And so what's his message? He says, son of man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. And so it's a, a message takes the form of a riddle and a parable. A riddle because it takes some explanation. And we're going to see that this morning. And a parable because it's given in the form of an allegory. So... Just someone, one person put it this way, the manner in which plants and animals relate in the story, carrying on as if they were humans. So the two eagles, the three shoots, they, you know, he's using them as it were to tell his story as if they're humans. And we see a lot of that, don't we? Like the a lot of kids' books like Beatrix Potter, and, you know, she's got these rabbits that act like humans. And so he's taking eagles and shoots and doing that same kind of thing. And so a, a riddle because it's taken the form, it takes some explanation, uh, a, a parable because it's given in this allegory form with these uh, plants and animals as if they're humans. And it, it would have amused the audience. It would have got their attention. Of course, they, they love to listen to Ezekiel. Later on, it's going to tell us that to them, he had a lovely voice. They actually came to, even though they had no intention of doing anything with what he said, they actually enjoyed hearing him speak because of the eloquence with which he spoke. And so this certainly would have enhanced his reputation as a spinner of riddles. And so in verses 1 through 10, we actually have the allegory. And then in verses 11 through 21, we have the interpretation of it. And then in verses 22 through 24, we have the epilogue. So it's kind of a pretty straightforward chapter. The allegory, the interpretation, the epilogue. And basically, the... There's two things going on. There's the parable of the eagles, which is in the first section of verses 1 through uh, 21. And then you have the parable of the cedar, which is verses 22 through 24. Again, we, we just reemphasize that this whole parable uh, describes events that took place between the time of King Jehoiakim's exile, when Nebuchadnezzar took him into Babylon in 597 BC. By the way, that's the same time when he was taken. Uh, that's the same time when others went along with him in that deportation. Some of the chief princes and others, 597 BC. So that, that's the when this takes place. And it's also uh, when Nebuchadnezzar placed Zedekiah on the throne. Uh, of Judah to replace uh, Jehoiakim, and the year that Zedekiah revolted against Babylon because he trusted in the promise of Egypt's help in 588 BC. So really, we can historically pin this chapter, 597 BC to 588 BC is the time frame that we're dealing with in the chapter. So we'll notice verse 3, and say, thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long wind, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came to Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. So again, just to get clear uh, interpretation, remember I said that 1 through 10 gives the parable and then 12 onwards gives the interpretation. So... Here's the interpretation, verse 12. Say now to the rebellious house, know ye not that the, 
what these things mean, tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem and hath taken the king thereof and the princes thereof and led them with him to Babylon. So the first great eagle here with great wings is the king of Babylon, who's come to take the king of Judah, who we know as Jeconiah, into captivity in Babylon with a lot of the chief princes. Okay, so that's clearly uh, given to us here in the text. Why does he say then that this eagle with great wings, long wind full of feathers which had diverse colors, came to Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar? Why does he refer to the cedar of Lebanon here? Well, it's a reference to Judah and Jerusalem. And the reason that it's a reference to Judah and Jerusalem is fairly simple. And that is this. If you look back with me just for a second to 1 Kings chapter 7, 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 2, both the house of God and the house of the king, Solomon's house, was made from cedars of Lebanon. And so that's why he refers to it as Lebanon. Chapter 7, verse 2, he built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. The length thereof was 100 cubits, and the breadth thereof 50 cubits, and the height thereof 30 cubits, and upon four rows of cedar pillars and cedar beams upon the pillars. And so we know that both the temple uh, in Jerusalem and also the, the house of Solomon, uh, all of the, the timber that was used to build it was taken from uh, Lebanon, from the cedars of Lebanon. So basically, they, it became synonymous with this kingdom because everything, you know, the, the house of God, the house of the king is all connected with it. So both the palace, the temple were made from the cedars of Lebanon. So the top of the cedar was Jehoiakim, who uh, along with the princes was carried to Babylon. We notice this verse four, he cropped off the top of this young twig and carried it into the land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. But it's kind of interesting too, that often in scripture, the eagle was used symbolically to represent God's punishment and, and, and the nations he would use to punish are often likened to eagles coming. So let me just show you that. Uh, again, this is, I suppose, a wonderful uh, lesson in comparing Scripture with Scripture. So you're going to have to turn to a lot of Scriptures this morning, but that's okay. It's just a healthy way of learning how, how Scripture fits together. Uh, so we see in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 49, it says, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Okay, so again, this is, remember, the, the covenant is laid out, the blessings and the cursings of God's covenant with that he entered into with Israel, what we call the Mosaic covenant. If you obey it, this is going to happen. If you disobey, this is going to happen. So this is the section of disobedience. And he said that when you disobey, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. And so again, the likening of God's judgment to an eagle uh, book of Isaiah, chapter 46. Prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 46. And verse 11, he says, Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, and will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. So again, now a ravenous bird. Of course, an eagle is a bird of prey. Uh, from the east, the man that executes my counsel. Again, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar. And then in the book of Jeremiah 48. Again, we're just seeing that this is a consistent testimony in the word of God to how eagles are used. Verse 40, for thus saith the Lord, says Jeremiah 48, 40, Behold, he shall fly as an eagle, and he shall spread his wings over Moab. 
48, 40, 49, 22. So it's not just judgment on, on Israel, but God is using it to judge the surrounding nations as well. Behold, he shall come up and fly as the eagle and spread his wings over Bosra. And at that day shall the heart of the mighty man of Edom be as the heart of a woman in her pang. So God's judgment on the nations is going to judge Moab, going to judge Edom. And again, he likens an eagle as his instrument uh, to rec represent his punitive power. So back again in our passage, 597 BC was when Jehoiakim, Daniel, and the others were taken into captivity. Jehoiakim had only reigned for three months in Judah. And again, isn't it amazing to think about that, that he was eight years of age, he only reigned three months, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. An eight-year-old, that should kind of <laughs> be staggering to us. Now, of course, no doubt he had advisors, an eight-year-old king. Uh, that's certainly, uh, but he was unlike other younger kings uh, that were set up that had more of a heart for God. He did not. Uh, he was wicked in his ways. And so he was taken into captivity uh, Nebuchadnezzar also at that time took the temple treasures and 10,000 officers, artisans, soldiers with him. And again, we we see that in Second Kings. They said we're going to be looking at all these uh, passages that throw light on this. But here we are again, Second Kings 24. And we'll see uh, this is what he is referring to. Second Kings 24, verse 8. So it says Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem. The city was besieged. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother, and his servants, and his princes, and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign, and he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem, and all the princes, and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land, and so on and so forth. He carries them all to Babylon. So can you imagine, this is what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. He's taking the, the king, the leading princes, men like Daniel uh, of high caliber, taking all the artisans, the craftsmen, all the, he's, in other words, he's taking all the kind of leadership of the nation away and leaving just the poor of the land. And so, of course, a, a very uh, typical kind of thing to deplete the usefulness of the nation. He's, he's stripping it of all the mighty men, all the, the men of, uh, of who'd be useful and, of course, this man, uh, Jeconiah, he's also called Kaniah by J Jeremiah uh, several times. Uh, and uh, uh, so Jehoiakim, sometimes referred to as Kaniah, sometimes as Jeconiah. And again, believe it or not, this rascal <laughs> is in the Messianic line, although there's a curse upon him, the curse on Jeconiah that not, not, not one of his offsprings w will reign. And that's where the, the whole issue of the virgin birth comes in and all the rest of it. So it's just kind of, that's an interesting thing in the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. During his three months on the throne, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He died in Babylon. So he's taken to this city of merchants, this land of traffic. It's kind of interesting how he describes it here. He cropped off the top of his young twigs, carried it onto the land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. And of course, Babylon, uh, for which this city was the most celebrated of all the cities of the earth, 
Remember one of the ancient wonders of the world, the gardens of Babylon, all the rest of it. And its situation made it into this city of commerce because you had two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, that came together in Babylon, as well as the Persian Gulf, uh, in order to be able to uh, do their merchandising in various places. And so it gave it communication with the richest and the most distant nations on earth. And so it became a land of traffic, and also it became a city of merchants. And again, there is some suggestion uh, in scripture that we've talked about before, that Babylon will once again be the commercial capital of the world in the end times. Be interesting to see uh, how that works out, but there's some thought that that will be the case. So notice verse five, he took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters, set it as a willow tree, and it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. So we see, uh, again, it's uh, it's going to be just this spreading vine. It's not going to be like a cedar. It's not going to be impressive, just like a spreading vine. And the idea is this, that basically uh, the, the point was it was going to be like a vassal nation. It would be, a, a, again, all the in intelligentsia is being removed. So it's just going to be a humble kind of de dependent uh, nation on uh, the Babylonians for its survival, basically. So it's going to be small, in, impressive, of low stature, uh, and uh, branches turned toward him. That's to to the eagle, to towards Babylon, depending on it. And uh, so it's a vine, and it's it's not strong at all. And so now our second shoot is is introduced uh, here. This seed of the land. Um, is uh, the one who is replacing uh, Jehoiakim. And so again, this is the puppet king that has been set up. Nebuchadnezzar uh, made uh, his uncle Mataniah the new king, changing his name to Zedekiah. Uh, that's uh, Jehoiakim's uncle. He's the youngest son of godly king Josiah. And so Nebuchadnezzar planted him in Judah, where he grew, reigning for 11 years. So again, let me just read from Second Kings. Chapter 24, once more, and verse 17. <clears throat> 24, 17, it says, And the king of Babylon made Mataniah his father's brother, king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. So instead of growing into a great cedar, as we've already said, it became a spreading vine of low stature. It was at this vassal state. And we get the explanation of it in verse 13 and 14 of Ezekiel 17. Uh, it says, uh, and he hath taken of the king's seed and made a covenant with him and hath taken an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land that the kingdom might be base, that it might not lift itself up, but that by keeping of his own covenant, it might stand. And so the, the basic thought here is this, that when Nebuchadnezzar had made a covenant with Zedekiah, although the kingdom was base, it would continue as long as the covenant was kept. And at first, Zedekiah was obedient. And so what he's saying is this, Judah would would still continue if it hadn't have broken this agreement with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, it would never be amount to much. It would be just a uh, basically a, a very poor uh, kingdom. The kingdom might be base of no consequences, but it still would continue to exist while ever this covenant agreement was in force uh, with Nebuchadnezzar. So verse 7 is where we have the introduction of the second eagle. There was another great eagle with great wings and many feathers, and behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him and shot forth her branches toward him that he might water it by the furrows of her plantations. 
So this state did not continue of them being kind of cared for by Babylon. We're now introduced to the second eagle, which is the king of Egypt. How do we know that? Look at verse 15. But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors to Egypt, that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that doeth such thing, things? Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? And so he now uh, is, we are introduced to uh, king of Egypt he, at that time, 588 BC. Uh, it was Pharaoh Hophra uh, who, who was the king. And Zedekiah foolishly looked to him for help. Let me read 2 Chronicles 36, 13. It says this, 2 Chronicles 36, 13. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck, hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. So instead of turning to the Lord to help him, he turns from Nebuchadnezzar, who he'd made this agreement with, and he turns to the king of Egypt. What strikes uh, the listener or reader is the bird's passivity. This just says there's another great eagle with wings. He's not doing anything. He's just there taking no action, just simply there. But he looks to him, uh, to Egypt, that he might water it by furrows of her plantations. So he hopes that this second eagle would care for the vine, protect it, and give it the right conditions for growth and prosperity. But it already had been cared for by the first eagle. And so, uh, again, the reason it does this is that it hopes that it would become a majestic vine and so that's the reason it's looking for the to the eagle uh he he wants to uh, be this a goodly majestic vine verse 8 was planted by good soil by great waters that it might bring forth branches that it might bear fruit and that it might be a goodly vine in other words it's pride in the heart of zedekiah he's not content to be this lowly kingdom he wants to be this goodly majestic vine uh, because again uh, and so he's looking to Egypt somehow that he might become a stronger and uh, more assertive, so to speak, even though it was already being taken cared for by Nebuchadnezzar. And so we're left once again to reflect on the vine's ingratitude and stupidity. Stupidity to break a covenant he'd made, swearing to God, and ingratitude because he could continue under the care of Nebuchadnezzar while ever it was content in its condition. And so in verse 8, uh, we said it was planted by good soil, by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine, looking in the wrong place. Verse 9, uh, so again, <clears throat> we, we might say this, uh, the favorable conditions Zedekiah and Judah were under if they had just been content there was no valid reason to rebel whatsoever. Verse 9, Say thou, thus saith the Lord God, shall it prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither, that it shall wither in all the leaves of a spring, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof? So the question is this, will the vine survive after it's turned away from the first eagle? and orientated itself towards the second eagle? That's the question. And it implies a strong negative answer. A summary judgment on Zedekiah throughout the, through the instrument, in, instrumentality of Nebuchadnezzar was announced. Even a small force was, of the Babylonian army would be sufficient to visit God's wrath upon them. Notice, notice how he, he words this in verse 9. He says, it shall wither in all the leaves of a spring, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. In other words, it wouldn't take much to destroy them. Now, again, Jeremiah tells us this in Jeremiah 37. You should remember, that was another one of the parallel passages that we could look to. But I really like the way he describes it in Jeremiah 37, verse 10. He says, for though you had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there remain but wounded men among them, 
yet should they rise up every man in his tent and burn this city with fire. And so what Jeremiah is saying is, even if you destroyed most of the, the, the army of the Babylonians and there were just a few wounded guys left, and the reason is because God is judging Zedekiah because he swore in God's name and broke the covenant. And so he said, even if it was a bunch of wounded men, they would still defeat you because God has basically taken his protection away from them. So the, though the vine stretched out roots and branches to the second eagle, the second eagle would not be able to shelter it against the coming storm. The vine would perish. Verse 10, yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither? When the east wind toucheth it, it shall wither in the furrows where it grew. So the redirection of the vine's branches toward the second eagle, instead of having them spread out low to the ground, its roots turned upwards. Instead of going deeper into the fertile, well-watered soil, it rendered the plant very vulnerable to the wind's withering force. And so basically, God is going to judge them because of this maneuvering and this move. So verse 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, and here we get all the explanations. We've already looked at verses 12 and 13 and 14. But verse 15 clearly explains the issue. He rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors to Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape? They do with such things. Shall he break the covenant and be delivered? It was because he broke the covenant he had made with Nebuchadnezzar. God asked the question, shall he prosper? Especially when the covenant had been sworn in the name of the Lord. And so again, just let's just remind ourselves of that very relevant scripture in Second Chronicles 36, 13, that this vow was made in the name of the Lord. 36, 13. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck, hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. So he broke this covenant that he had made, in God's name, should he prosper? Could such treachery, which had called upon the name of the Lord, avoid such punishment at the hands of God, who had been so insulted? The sanctity of an oath was ingrained in Israel, even when made by fraudulent purposes. So I want you to go back to the book of Joshua, just remember, this is this just shows how God takes vows seriously. So Joshua 9, verse 14, it, it says this, um, And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them, this is the Gibeonites, and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the covenant swear unto them, and it came to pass at the end of three days, after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. And the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities in the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Chephira and Beeroth and kirjath Jearim. And the children of Israel smote them not because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. Now we need to look at 2 Samuel 21. So they make this agreement, even though the people they're making the agreement with them were fraudulent in their claims. They said they came from a long distance. You know, they tricked them, all the rest of it. Notice that they didn't seek counsel at the hand of the Lord. They entered into this agreement and swore in the name of the Lord that they would uh, let the Gibeonites live and when we look at chapter 21 of Second Samuel, it says, Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said to them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, the children of Israel had sworn unto them, 
and Saul sought, sought, to, sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. So, <laughs> interesting uh, that God holds people responsible when they make vows. And I suppose the practical application for you and I is this. When we enter into agreements, first of all, be careful <laughs> that you swear in the name of the Lord. I think it'd be better if we don't do that. But God says to us, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. In other words, keep your word. Even if it's to your own hurt, be a man of your word because God takes it very seriously. And especially when it's made in his name because it involves him in it, you see. Bringing him into the equation, uh, he's a covenant-keeping God, and so if you make an, a covenant in his name, it makes him look like he's somebody who breaks his covenants, but he doesn't. He's a covenant-keeping God. That's one of the overall themes that we've seen in our study of this very important book of Ezekiel. And so he says in verse 16, he says, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he break, even with him in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. Again, when God says, as I live, he is the living God. And so as I live, says the, says the, says the Lord, the place where the king dwelleth, Babylon, that made him king, whose oath he despised, he will and whose covenant he break in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. Of course, we know that, that he, his eyes are put out after his own sons are killed before his eyes. Then he taken into Babylon, and he died in Babylon. And here's the tragedy. Thus ended the 20th and last king of Judah, blind and dying in captivity in Babylon. And so it's kind of a pretty sad kind of ending, isn't it, to uh, what started out so gloriously with David's reign. David's descendants end up, the last remaining descendant, dying, as it were, uh, in uh, a last remaining king, dying in Babylon and blinded. So from verse 17 on to verse 21, I want you to notice there's a, there's a, Continual idea of mine oath. Uh, let's look at verse 18. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant when, lo, he had given his hand and had done all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense on his own head. And so again, the idea is this that Pharaoh and his army would be powerless to deliver Zedekiah and Judah from its fate now because this king had made an oath in God's name. And so he calls it mine oath. And so if we're learning anything, God, yeah, in the study of Ezekiel, he's the covenant-keeping God to swear in his name and not do it reflects very badly on his name. And again, we have to be really careful, don't we? We've just been thinking about this. I did a study yesterday with a young man about evangelism and, and the gospel. And one of the things that I, I emphasized was the fact that we are a reflection on the character of the God we represent. And so if we want to be good in the gospel, we better uh, give a good picture of the one who we are re uh, representing. And so... Uh, swearing in, in his name, very something we've got to be very, very careful about. Uh, be trustworthy. Keep your word even to your own hurt. That is the overall message of this section. Now, uh, from the, the rest of the chapter, the epilogue, we don't have time. We'll have to wait till next time. But there's, there's hope even in this chapter. And it's a... Uh, hope that uh, uh, even though uh, it seems like it's all over for the kings of Judah, there's going to be a root that will come out of dry ground. <laughs> and God is going to set him on a high mountain, and there's going to be a glorious kingdom. And I wish we could have got there and finished it, but we'll have to wait because our hour has passed and the time has gone. May the Lord encourage us with these thoughts.